Hello and welcome to the Keeping Your Family Home webinar. My name is Shari Williams and I'm happy to be here with you all today for this engaging event where we will introduce the key findings from our recently released Keeping Your Family Home report. We are hoping to inspire ideas and actions that Detroiters, nonprofits, and policymakers can take to resolve the issues um, at hand and also explore ideas, innovations, and initiatives aimed at addressing heirs' property issues to both preserve and increase home ownership. At Detroit Future City, we see this topic of inherited properties as a critical component to preserving and increasing home ownership in Detroit, and also an opportunity to build generational wealth. So thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. And also thank you so much for taking the poll. I'm going to conclude the poll right now, but I think it's really interesting just to highlight, I'll share with you all what the results are, 44% um, of the folks that have been able to take the poll so far have indicated they do not have a will or an estate plan. And that is a critical component to being able to preserve our family homes, right? And so as you all see here, just from your own personal perspective and experiences, this is a very important topic. So thank you once again for um, being with us. Um, I'm excited for the lineup that we have today. Um, we are going to start off um, with a presentation from Ashley Williams Clark at Detroit from, from Detroit Future City, um, who will present the key findings from our report. We also have a dynamic panel, which includes Christopher Smith of Jacksonville Lisk, Alyssa Petroni from Michigan Legal Services, and Mac Farr from Villages CDC. And then we also have a moment to hear from you all with questions um, for our incredible guests as well. As we get started, I would like to encourage everyone to follow DFC social media and share and engage with us by um, sharing, excuse me, sharing information using our DFC hashtag, which is hashtag DFC ideas. Also, we have printed copies of the report available for no cost. So be sure to use that link in the chat to request as many copies as you need, and we'll gladly mail them to you. Lastly, we are pulling out the chat function at this time, um, but we want you to continue to share your thoughts and ideas in the box. If questions come up for our panelists, please place your questions there and we will work to get through as many questions as possible during that segment of the event. So at this time, I am really excited and so thankful to welcome Laura Greneman um, with the Gilbert Family Foundation. Um, the Keeping Your Family Home report was developed with research support from Data Driven Detroit and was funded by the Gilbert Family Foundation, whose mission it is to support the economic stability and mobility of Detroiters. We are happy to have Laura join us today and provide with you all some welcoming remarks and share how this project emerged. Following Laura, our CEO, Anika Goss, would join the screen to provide a brief address as well. Now, without further ado, Laura Greneman is the Vice President of Rocket Community Fund and Executive Director of the Gilbert Family Foundation. In her dual roles, Laura focuses on breaking down complex systems related to economic development and neighborhood stabilization. Laura, I'd like to pass it to you to provide the audience with your welcoming remarks. Amazing. Thank you so much. I'm really, really excited to be here today because this has really been the culmination of several years of work and focus on behalf of many, many partners, probably some of you in the audience included. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of why this work is important to us, and I'll do my very best to the Detroit Future City team to not spoil any of the amazing findings that they have. Um, but I'll maybe give a, a couple of uh, high level overviews of why this is important to us. So a few years ago, the Gilbert Family Foundation and the Rocket Community Fund made a $500 million commitment to building opportunity in the city of Detroit for Detroit residents. And one of the places that we start with that $500 million commitment 
is by working to keep Detroit residents and in particular longtime Detroit residents in their homes. Uh, we, we did this first, actually our very first investment was uh, called the Detroit Tax Relief Fund, which is a $15 million commitment that is made operationalized by the Wayne Metro team to pay off the back taxes of any income qualified homeowner who can qualify for the homeowner's property tax exemption in the city of Detroit. Essentially saying, going forward, you should not have to pay your property taxes if you are economically vulnerable. And if you, going forward, can get that property tax exemption, we'll also pay off your back taxes. Well, this was an amazing opportunity. So far, we've supported about 10,000 Detroit residents. We're so proud of the work. But one of the things that we saw over and over again is that people would call thinking that they owned their homes and realize through the application process that their name was actually not on the deed. And uh, at first we thought, oh, maybe this is just happening once or twice. But when it happened over and over and over again, we realized this is really a hidden issue that we need to start to work with partners to elevate and understand better. Um, and we we are always so respectful and in awe of the work that Detroit Future City does to elevate issues just like this. So we were excited to approach them and talk a little bit more about how could we operationalize um, a, a research study that might help us understand this issue better and ultimately bring stakeholders together to be able to then drive investments and policy changes that will support the people who really need probate services and, and ultimately help others avoid needing those probate services in the future. So I'm really, really proud of the ultimate research uh, that has come out of this partnership. It has been the work of many on this call and beyond. And ultimately, I think it will help to address the needs of thousands of families um, who collectively own hundreds of millions of dollars worth of real estate in the city of Detroit. It is important to us that we keep that wealth in the Detroit community and in particular in the black community. Uh, and we hope that this is really just the beginning of a conversation and we're excited to take action and next steps. So with that, I will pass it over to Anika um, and I look forward to hearing the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and again, we are so grateful to the Gilbert Family Foundation for uh, your continued support and the support for this uh, body of research. I'm Anika Goss. I'm the president and CEO here at Detroit Future City. And I am so thrilled that so many of you are joining us this afternoon to talk about this issue. The, the concept of an heir's property is foreign to most of us. The, but, but the idea that someone has inherited a grandparent's home a great grandparent's home, a parent's home, is something that uh, most of us are dealing with, regardless if you are living in a very low income area or if you are living in a middle class area or even more. Detroit has been a center for home ownership for centuries here in Detroit, for at least the past hundred years. And for many black families, this was a source of wealth this was the one area that they knew they could generate wealth to pass down to their families. And the idea that you might not be able to live up to your grandmother's dream of owning that home because of tangled title, because of probate, is, is something that we really absolutely need to solve, that we need to prioritize solving together. And I'd like to believe that this research helps us begin to do that. Before we, we begin, I wanna just take another opportunity to thank our partners as the city of Detroit, Wayne County uh, Office of, the Wayne County Treasurer's Office, and the uh, Office of uh, Deeds and, and Register of Deeds. This, these departments all came together to help us really figure out what the actual number was, how, what the risk was for losing your home, 
these were critical partners in making sure that this report could be a tool for Detroiters to be able to use. I'd also like to thank our uh, panelists today, both from Jacksonville, Florida, that's leading this work nationally, and our two local partners with the Michigan Legal Services and Villages Development. These are partners right here in the city that can help us solve for their is this issue. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ashley Williams-Clark, who's going to go over the research for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anika. And I'm so excited to be here to share the findings from our research. And I'll be sharing some of the key findings and high level findings from the report, because I really wanna make sure that we have time to get to our exciting and dynamic panel. And so I encourage everybody to go to our website to be able to access the full report. Building off of Anika's thank yous, I really wanna acknowledge that this was a collaborative research project it was a partnership between Detroit Future City and our data partner, Data Driven Detroit. And I also want to give a very big shout out to Vanita and Juan from our team who are the co-authors of this report. But also, and very importantly, to the focus group participants and the community partners who lent their time, expertise, and lived experience to this research. It was truly invaluable. So we've been talking a lot about heirs properties, and we've been saying that term. But what is an heir's property? So it's a property inherited through generations or passed on to recipients without formal legal proceedings to prove ownership. And so when that happens and there's no legal um, transfer, what can happen is that as the property passes through generations, more and more heirs are added and the title and ownership can become very tangled. So how does this happen? There's kind of two primary ways that a property can turn into an heir property. So first, in the absence of a will or when a property is not included in the will, something kicks in that's called intestate secession, which is basically a law that states the, the heirs that have a right to that property. And what that can lead to is many different heirs having a share of that property and resulting in shared ownership or something called tenancy in common. The other way is that there is a will, but having a will is not the only thing. That will has to be administered through the probate court to be able to say that the will is valid and then to also legally transfer the property forward. So how did we go about doing this work and why are some of the challenges in this? We talked to community partners. We heard from Detroit residents who are facing this. And we heard a lot of different dynamics at play when it comes to why folks don't have a will or why they are having trouble going through the probate process. The first, as we saw with the, the poll um, and even seeing some national surveys, is that many homeowners just don't have wills or an estate plan in place. And one of the challenges with that is just frankly the high out-of-pocket costs that can surround legal advice and case filings. And that's not just for wills, but also for administering wills. And we'll hear more from Alyssa later on about this as well. This is also really complex. I say this as somebody who's just went through this process myself. Um, and there exists really a lack of support in navigating the complex legal processes, both around getting a will, but will execution in a state administration as well. And as Laura noted, oftentimes, people might not even be aware of the fact that there wasn't a legal transfer of the property. And so they're not aware of the fact that their name isn't actually on the deed. It would amaze you as we've had these conversations, how many times someone's brain ticks and goes, oh my goodness, I need to double check if I'm on that deed. There also needs to be more information we heard from folks about property tax implications. First of all, people thinking that if they're paying property taxes, that that means that they, that's proof of ownership of the property, when in fact it's not. The other piece of it is better understanding and information on what it means and what the implications are for your property taxes when that property does transfer and resources available to help you with those costs. And then lastly, one of the things that we heard is that the housing market and neighborhood perceptions play a role both in terms of somebody seeing value in the home and wanting to pass it on, but also 
in terms of the heirs taking ownership of that home and caring for it. And when we looked at the impact of this, it's important that the impact is kind of twofold. It's on the individual, certainly in terms of if you're living in a home and you find out that you're not the owner of it, that can impact your household stability and your ability to stay in that home long term. It also impacts your ability to access resources from the city or others that require you to be the formal owner of that property. The other piece of it, and when we talk about generational wealth, generational transfer of property, if you don't have your name on that deed, if you're not the legal owner, it can limit your ability to realize some of that generational wealth in terms of selling the property, borrowing money against it, um, or even other practical matters like obtaining homeowner's insurance. And all of this can have a ripple effect in terms of neighborhood condition if the home is not claimed, is not cared for, or falls into an issue with uh, multiple owners who aren't able to care for the property. So how did we identify these properties? We modeled our study off of a great study that was done in Philadelphia by Pew. And what we did is we were able to take data from the city of the Detroit office of the assessor, which had the owner names listed for all of the parcels in Detroit. And we looked at those residential properties and we matched those against death records dating back to 2014. And what we ended up with was a list of all likely heirs properties, which are parcels where all listed owners are deceased. What we found was that there are 5,525 residential properties in Detroit that are likely heirs properties. And of those, the majority are likely owner occupied. Another 15% are renter occupied, which has another set of implications for renters who are living in properties and paying rent to landlords who don't own the property legally. In terms of where we found the properties, um, we found them both on the east side and the west side. On the west side, we found them um, between Schaefer and Lodge and Seven and Eight Mile, also around Schultz and Bagley. On the east side, we saw concentrations around Airport Sub, Hawthorne Park, Cadillac Heights, and in southwest around Boynton. Of all of these, we found 35 census tracts that had more than 40 heirs properties, and that represents 13% of all census tracts in Detroit. But it's also looking at not just where they are, but the value of the neighborhoods and where those properties are. And we found 27 different census tracts with a median home sales price of at least $150,000, um, with a total heirs property count of 215. So this is an issue that affects across the city, but it also impacts not only low-income neighborhoods, but also what we would consider middle-class neighborhoods and properties that have higher values. In total, we found that there was over $268 million locked in in terms of property value in those 5,525 heirs properties total. So as we think about solutions, it's important to think about how we can focus in on some of those properties that have large amounts of value tied to them. It's also important that we look at properties that are most at risk. We were able to cross-reference our list of heirs properties with properties that are at risk of tax foreclosure. And we found that there were 496 properties that are currently at immediate risk for tax foreclosure that were identified as heirs properties. Another critical component as we talk about heirs properties is that it's not just who's currently an heir property, but the reality is that for any of us, or any person who has not gone through an estate planning process or have a will, that property is at risk of becoming an heir's property in the future. So we looked at a couple different factors that we um, vetted against national literature as well as our own Detroit dynamics. And we looked at a couple of um, factors that are related to increased risk and decreased risk. In terms of increasing risk of future heir's properties, um, share of households that are 65 and older living alone, um, parcels with a quick claim deed, parcels that are vacant, and decreased risk, parcels that have an estate planning or related deed. What we found is that there were 40 tracks across the city with a high potential future risk of heirs properties, but we noticed that um, a particular concentration on the near west side, and some drivers of that include you know, the older age of the population, so that's that 65 years of age and older living alone, as well as parcels with quick claim deeds filed. As we look to where we go from here, and again, our panel is gonna dive much more deeply into this, there's three areas in which we need to be focusing our attention. 
First, around how do we resolve the current heirs' properties? How do we address those current 5,525 properties? Then how do we prevent future heirs' properties from happening? And how do we look at the systems level for opportunities to reform the probate process and others to make sure that the impacts of heirs' property are not stripping people of generational wealth and that we're able to keep people in their family homes? In terms of resolving current heirs' properties, there's opportunities to increase coordination and capacity of our system, legal system in particular, and its support organizations to handle property cases um, from intake to resolution, and also opportunities to connect heirs to more resources through which they can obtain their title. In terms of preventing future heirs' properties, there's a really big component around outreach and education. Again, also looking at how do we expand our will and estate planning support through strategic partnerships? How do we expand legal clinics? How do we get partnerships with legal professionals and community development organizations and create resources that are truly um, legally compliant, but also user-friendly? And how do we finance those supports? And then also, how do we think about ways to create stable pathways for homes without designated heirs? So for those properties that someone doesn't want to inherit or doesn't have an heir, making sure that those properties um, don't get lost in limbo. Lastly, on the policy reform front, how do we think about opportunities to improve the probate process to both save time and costs? That means looking at um, creating opportunities to simplify paperwork, creating separate dockets, increasing staff capacity. Um, also, how do we make sure that if you're in an heir's property, you still have access to some of those critical resources that um, currently require you to be listed on the deed? There's examples nationally of folks who are um, not requiring you to be formally on the deed if you're going through an heir's property process and accepting alternative forms of homeownership proof. And lastly, there's opportunities to look at the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, which we just learned has been introduced in our Michigan State um, Legislature just recently. And that's a legislation that can prevent um, the sale of a property for below market value, and it can protect the rights of co-tenants um, from the property from being sold at auction. So that was a rapid fire of everything that's inside of the report. As I mentioned, those are the high level findings and I encourage everybody to go to the website, read the full report, dive into those findings, and also know that we have a primer. And that primer provides you a high level overview of what are heirs properties and also includes a list of um, community resources, um, information, organizations that if you're facing an heirs property, want to dive more into um, what's available, you can go to that toolkit or that primer and learn more about what's out there. With that, I'll hand it back to Shari to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Ashley. That was a great presentation. So informative. Thank you so much for your time. Audience, um, if you have questions for the research team, feel free to drop those questions in the chat box and um, your question will be addressed there. Um, we also welcome you to email us at info at DetroitFutureCity.com um, if you have questions that you'd like to dig deeper with our research team on. Um, as we move into the discussion portion of this webinar, I am so excited for this webinar, um, for this panel, um, and I'm excited to welcome them to the screen as well. First, we have um, Christopher Smith, who is the Community Development Officer, Program Officer, excuse me, at Jacksonville List. In his role, he oversees their Family Wealth Creation Initiative and its efforts to advance economic growth in urban core neighborhoods. Christopher brings nearly 20 years of experience in community engagement and development, grant making, and capacity building to the organization. Next, we have Alyssa Petroni, who is the Supervising Probate Attorney at Michigan Legal Services, also known as MLS. MLS aims to engage and advocate for public policies that address and remedy root causes of poverty and fulfill essential human needs for families. And lastly, I wanna welcome Mac Farr to the screen as well, who is our executive, who is the executive director at Villages CDC, leading initiatives that supports and advocates for the development of inclusive places and neighborhoods within the villages. Mac's background 
focused on development of infrastructure, housing stabilization, transportation, policy advocacy, and community engagement. Welcome all, and how is everyone doing today? Wonderful. Um, are you all able to unmute? Wonderful, okay, just wanted to make sure. Oh, I'm so thankful for having you all today here with us and looking forward to this conversation. Um, Chris, I wanna start with you. Um, Jacksonville LISC is a part of a national movement to address heirs' properties, and is also playing a critical role locally in Jacksonville to coordinate efforts that address air properties in community of color. Could you share more about your work and how addressing heirs property issues could mitigate the effects of other housing stressors and how this all connects to the broader goal to advance economic growth in urban core communities? And Chris, I know you also have some slides, so just let us know when you want us to pull those up. Well, well thanks, Sherry. And uh, thanks to Detroit Future City and leadership there for allowing me to speak for a few minutes about this important work. Um, that, that research is incredible, by the way. Um, so kudos to your folks in pulling that together. We can go there to the slides because that'll tee up a couple of comments I want to make quickly. Um, the first slide you're looking at is sort of, a, uh, it's a bird's eye view of air's concentration across the Southeast, where we know nationally there's a um, higher prevalence of this issue in the Southeast due to history of policy and practice in this country. And so Jacksonville, Florida is in the northeast corner of Florida there. You can see the darker shaded areas uh, represent higher number of cases. And we can go to the next slide. Um, as we think about Jacksonville, we began to look at the implications of air's prevalence in specific uh, census tracts, as was noted by Ashley. And we looked at correlations between non-owner occupied housing trends and air's prevalence. And so here's the headline where you see the higher um, percentage of non-owner occupied housing that also layers with and, and it parallels with the higher prevalence of heirs property concentration. So in a nutshell, as a, as a local government and as a key stakeholder, we know that if we want to do something about increasing home ownership, we've got to reduce the cost of financial insecurity that results from heirs prevalence. You can go to the next slide. So this is um, an, another uh, way of thinking about it. So well-being is an important sort of intersectional approach to this work. And essentially what we've learned from our health partners is heirs property, um, there's a through line between heirs property prevalence and housing insecurity. And we know that housing insecurity affects well-being. And so you get this circular notion going. The, the ability to lower heirs property will increase housing security, increase financial security, and enable people to actually increase their well-being. Next slide. So our strategy is similar to a number of things Ashley mentioned in the report. Essentially, we're using a data and evidence-based approach, identifying the key neighborhoods that have the highest prevalence, designing interventions with those most affected, identifying the right partners, and then resourcing this work in ways that we hope that will tip the market. So our notion is that we need to hit 15% in order to tip the market and generate naturally occurring behavior. That is, people will seek out legal services despite perhaps not having the resources available to cover the cost, but they will begin to take what they've learned about the topic and take the next step, which is action. Talking with a housing counseling agency, speaking with uh, their local legal aid, uh, services agencies in order to understand how they may go about preserving equity gains and preserving home ownership. Next slide. So one of the tools we've developed is, is getting at this notion of um, really this two-step dance. What we found is uh, residents need to hear the issue and in some cases sit with it and then come back to it and hear it again. And then that second moment, they take action. And so what we've done here is, and, and folks can take a picture of this QR code, we've developed some communication tools in partnership with our behavior insights team um, 
folks out of New York City that that looks at ways to improve narrative capabilities around this area's challenge. What are the compelling new stories, language, and frames that will bring people into a room and encourage them to take on this important and yet complex topic? Um, we know that we need to do this work in relationship to our partners. And so you go to the next slide. At this one, this is just to give you a sense of, we think of this work in terms of an ecosystem approach. It's gonna require folks in communications, in data, in, in research. It's gonna help also folks on the ground who are community organizers articulate why this topic is most important and in a pro, pro, uh, persuasive manner. So I think I will end with this notion that our work is really trying to hit on three fronts. We got to find them. And when I mean them, likely heirs households, we have to then preserve um, their ownership stake and equity gains. And then we have to support them through what many will tell you is a, in a housing system that is complex. And when you add this issue of heirs, it becomes even more daunting for folks who are unfamiliar with how to navigate the bureaucratic and legal um, systems. And with that, I think I'll pause and stop. Thanks. Thank you. Wow. There were so many gems and and what you share, Chris. I appreciate appreciate you there. Um, Alyssa, I want to turn to you. Um, could you take a moment to share a little bit more about what MLS does and how MLS interventions are supporting Detroiters with navigating the heirs' property processes? And let me know when you want your slides put up as well. Okay. Yes, thank you so much for having me on the panel. And you can pull the first slide up. Um, to situate Michigan Legal Services advocacy, right now MLS provides probate assistance through the filing of decedents' estates for low-income heir occupants in Wayne County that are subject to property tax foreclosure and mortgage foreclosure. The subject to property tax foreclosure heir occupants are the largest percentage of MLS probate clients currently. And as a general disclaimer, my comments are my opinions and should not be construed as legal advice. And my goal here in just a couple minutes is to provide a bit of the on the ground context to the reality for air occupants to illustrate some of the barriers and impacts of delayed title transfer um, that can really help explain why there is a, a multitude of tangled titles here in Detroit. So beginning with barriers to estate administration, the first and foremost problem is the lack of estate planning documentation. The, I'm speaking about wills and trusts. About 90 to 95% of my clients are coming to me without the decedent having a will or a trust. So therefore, we have to use intestate secession, which under Michigan law um, can be counterintuitive to the general understanding of who is an heir, who isn't an heir, and the percentage of interest they have in the estate. Um, and the lived reality is that some of these pool of heirs can get quite large and can lead to conflict. The other thing is um, the Wayne County Probate Court can be quite inaccessible and can be very difficult for people to use um, who don't have computer savvy or, or Adobe knowledge. And the other thing is financial limitations. Without an attorney, it would cost about two to $600 uh, to administer an estate with an attorney, attorney's fees can cost thousands of dollars. So next slide, please. And then <laughs> some of the biggest um, impacts of delayed title transfer, as I have said, is the expanding pool of heirs under intestate secession. And then the various debts that can occur on a property, be they property tax debts or water debts are the two largest. And for property tax, those folks can then not access the owner occupant assistance programs, such as the ERSPA for Wayne County uh, back taxes, or the HOPE for the city of Detroit current year taxes, or the periodic programs that get funded like my half, or some of the repair programs that'll pop up, or even the weatherization programs through Wayne Metro. And then what this results in are properties that have tax debt, backwater debt and repairs, and it can just be very difficult for families dealing with large air pools to navigate not only the financial cost of probate, the actual logistics of probate without any attorney assistance, pro se, 
and then inheriting a property that has a bunch of debt and needs repairs. So um, sorry, I went through all this quite quickly, but I'm hoping that there's some questions. That was great. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I think that was a great high level overview of like where some of the chance of challenges are that some of your clients. Uh, Mac, let's turn over to you. Um, if you could start off by just taking a moment to introduce the audience to Villages CDC and the boundaries that you serve. Excellent. Thank you, Shari. Um, and special thanks to uh, Laura Granderman and Anika to serve as some of this important work. Um, when Laura was initially talking a little bit about initially running into some of these cases and thinking it was a one-off, it was very similar to our experience. Um, so it's gratifying to see, you know, this realization spreading across different organizations and different sectors. Um, the Villages CDC is a community development organization that works um, on the lower east side of Detroit, from Mack Avenue going down to the river, from Mount Elliott in the west, all the way over to St. Jean in the east. And in 2021, we started up our signature housing program called Keep It in the Family. Um, the name is very much, it tries to encapsulate what we were trying to convey to a lot of our residents that, you know, keeping your home in your family was important. And the genesis of the program really came about as a result of just going to meetings and encountering case after case of, you know, folks that were just out in the neighborhoods that weren't able to access home repair programs or tax assistance programs. It was a case where, to me, initially it wasn't obvious, but the more digging we did, the more that we realized that we had an issue as it related to just a lack of estate planning and deed issues that was preventing people from being able to take advantage of these programs. And so beginning in 2021, um, we began working directly with clients in a four-step process where um, we 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 started off by doing a title search on the house, and that was to make sure that our clients had clear title. The second thing that we did was that we made sure they were current on taxes and utilities. Um, and the third item was that we would set the household up with a will. And we worked initially through elder law, um, which is another nonprofit in Southeast Michigan, uh, in order to get the household set up not only with wills, but also ladybird ladybird deeds. And that was geared towards minimizing the expense and hassle of transferring property ownership to the next generation. Um, we are now deep in our fourth round of Keep It In The Family. Today, we have assisted 38 households. And the thing about this work really is in an era when resources are scarce, this can be a force multiplier. We live in an era where housing is very expensive. And Detroit is a city where that not, has not always been the case. It used to be you could get a house for not a lot of money. But, you know, as the report indicated, even these homes, you know, they may not be ideal, but the cheapest house you're ever going to live in is the one you already own. If we come together and do more work on operationalizing this, we'll be able to help stabilize neighborhoods. We will help families be able to retain wealth and we will be able to help reduce blight. And, you know, there's also the perspective of when we do this, you know, when you're able to maintain clear ownership patterns, that's going to prevent repair dollars from having to be spent. So this is one of those aspects where it ticks so many boxes across the board and the payoff for relatively modest investments uh, really is logarithmic. Thank you. Incredible work, Mac, um, and such powerful results. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us. Chris, I want to turn back over um, to you. Um, the work that you are um, coordinating in Jacksonville involves a variety of partners, and you started to touch on this when you spoke a moment ago. Um, it's reflective of multiple components that are addressing air properties. Could you share more about who's at the table, who you're working, um, who's working together to address the challenges of air properties, and why this collaborative approach is so important? 
So I'm gonna start with the last first. It's important because we've got to move faster in order to um, combat the, the erosion of wealth that results from the lack of clear title. Okay, so there's a there's a notion of speed that we've got to get faster at doing this work in order to help people realize the equity gains. As to who we're working with, uh, I'll go back to my three, my number three here. Okay, so um, let's deal with comms first. So community trusted partners, CDCs on the ground, who are known in the community, who have monthly me meetings, who know folks that are maybe in need of help, but are unfamiliar with the process. Those are the folks we try to engage in and invest in to help carry the message forward and provide them the tools to do so. So that's on the comm side. On the data side, it's it's some of the public partners that have been mentioned today, tax collector, property appraiser's office, clerk of the courts, all critical to provide public data. And we create sort of a data sandwich by partnering with our University of Florida folks to bring the public sector data together with private data like CoreLogic to help paint a picture of the amount of stress that's generated by the prevalence of heirs. We think of heirs as being a canary in the coal mine. If we don't deal with heirs, the other housing stressors are only going to compound over time. All right, so you got data and you got this notion of, of these partners out there that are helping us on the legal side as well. So legal partners is who you've discussed and who are on this call today, legal services, legal aid. But then folks engaging the local bar. We found that there are some folks out there in firms that are willing to take on cases. Usually we like to provide a central intake process by which we're able to screen folks and then farm out cases through the pro bono networks. So it's legal team. So think of a legal tiger team, a data tiger team, and then a comms team all coming together. And you need a quarterback, Sherry, to make this all work. And so we've tried to act in that role by aggregating resources and helping coordinate it, um, support. Wonderful, thank you so much, Chris. Alyssa, I think that's a great transition over to you as well. Um, you all are um, play a huge role in helping families that are at risk of tax foreclosure. Uh, could you tell us more about how MLS is working to help lessen the chance um, that at-risk properties end up in foreclosure and how that ties into the topic at hand here? Yes. Um, eligibility to be a current MLS probate client is hinged upon uh, property tax or mortgage foreclosure at this point in time. So the current clients that the MLS probate team is dealing with are all folks who, but for our intervention, would be foreclosed this year if they didn't make a payment on the back taxes due to Wayne County. So these are parcels that have back taxes due um, back at least to 2021. Right now, we're seeing folks that have between back to 2021 all the way back to 2015. Um, so our intervention that we do is we have a deadline of having to have the probate case filed by March 28th. And when we provide that information to the Wayne County Treasurer, they will pause the tax foreclosure for a year, giving us time to administer the estate and then direct the now hopefully owner um, to the correct resources to get on a payment plan and then to stabilize the tax issue with the property. I will say as well that um, Detroit Future Cities did share with the partners the 496 parcels that are subject to tax foreclosure that are potentially tangled title. Um, we did a mailing out to them. As of today, I received an update that around 373 are still subject to foreclosure. Okay. That's incredible how you were able to use that data to try to get ahead of, of this challenge though. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, Mac, I want to turn it over to you. Um, you know, we talk a lot about this um, and, and even the, the purpose of this, this webinar is to really, to really lift up how important it is to preserve and increase home ownership um, as, as well as build generational wealth. We see this as critical components to creating thriving and resilient communities um, and advancing economic equity. Um, and that's something that we here at DFC care um, tremendously about. Um, we heard in the presentation that Detroit has more than 5,500 air properties worth about $270 million. How has the Keep It in the Family initiative impacted the community as a whole? 
And how um, would you say that it has also impacted the individuals in the community as well with their ability to access or build generational wealth? Yeah. Um, what I've noticed a lot about this program really is that our clients, you know, they're, they're aware that there is something that they need to do, but they're not entirely sure what it is that they need to do. And that's where I think the case management element of this really comes into play. It's a daunting task where you're talking about a lot of institutions that people do not really enjoy interacting with, like lawyers and tax collectors and the court and documents. And so by combining a lot of those front-end activities that I talked about, title search, tax and utility checks, as well as um, setting up a will with a ladybird deed, that's the front end. We've paired that with $2,500 for home repairs, and that's sort of like dessert. The front end activities, title search, utilities, and setting up a will, that's very much eat your vegetables. And what I've noticed is that, but for that modest amount of home repairs, a lot of our clients would not actually probably enter into our program. So I think, I think we need to push back against a lot of fear. There's fear of just the unknown. There is fear of, you know, deed fraud. I remember the first round of clients that we had, uh, people were, they were sort of nervous about working with us. In some cases, we had a couple of clients say, I'm afraid you're going to try to steal our house. And, you know, that wasn't a likely outcome, but as we have seen with some of the news out of UCHC, in the past couple of weeks, it unfortunately happens. I don't think that could have come at a worse time, unfortunately, particularly from such an outstanding organization. But I think there's a real need to scale a lot of what it is that we're doing. It needs to be industrialized because each time somebody dies in testate, that just makes the process logarithmically harder. Um, we have an obligation to industrialize and scale these activities so that we can more firmly ensconce people in their homes. I love what you said. Thank you, Mac. Um, I think that so many powerful gems in there, right? And, and really bringing in like what the lived experience is, what people are dealing with, what their fears are, and how that's also impacting um, some, some of the ways that we can work together to, to address the issue. Uh, I have another question, and then I want to turn to audience questions. Um, and this is for the full panel, um, anyone that feels compelled to answer it. But as efforts to remedy title issues and air properties continue to gain momentum locally and across the country, what reforms can reduce systemic barriers that exist for Detroiters and other people of color to maintain ownership of their family homes? retain generational wealth and limit the number of homes that become air properties. And you all have kind of touched on this, but if you can just kind of provide your last word, summary, synopsis, what comes up for you when you hear that question? I guess I can go first. Um, my, my immediate answer would be accessibility of low cost or free legal services. There are, you know, the Michigan intestate succession is a Michigan based law. Every county's probate court is going to be administered by the county and controlled by the state courts. It's a little more difficult to kind of budge policy action on that level. But I think it is easier to to fund legal clinics, to fund legal services, to fund law schools, to have a clinical component to address decedents estates and then also address the estate document preparation which could be two very different interventions, but I think money for legal services. Yeah, I, I would like to echo those sentiments 1,014%, you know, coming up with providers that can actually case manage different pieces of the estate planning and clearing and the process of clearing title is gonna be critical. Um, you know, I don't know that in our system of how we, legislate property ownership you know these are concepts of english common law that have descended over thousands of years and it's actually going to be a lot easier 
to reimagine how we speak to the case management aspect of this rather than like you know redesigning the legal framework of property ownership um i really think that you know state and local contributions towards this uh, this number where coming up with some out some system that can actually scale is going to be critical and the last thing i want to touch on is actually the Wayne County Probate Court. Um, right now, you know, the, the the sort of floor that we've identified is like 5,500 properties. And that's that's just the ones that we can document. I think that one of the questions, and I'm probably jumping a bit ahead here, had to do with the timing of the study. And, you know, there are going to be at, at least 5,500 cases. Um, if you today drop an additional 5,500 cases in the Wayne County Probate Court, um, the system would seize up and you would need to get some retired judges or some visiting judges in order to speed up that docket, similar to what the Detroit Land Bank Authority has done with its nuisance uh, case docket. So it's really about adequately resourcing the system that's providing it and making sure that system particularly in the courts venue, has the capacity to handle that additional caseload. Um, that's that's going to be critical. Yeah. Right. Hey, Sherry, I, I throw one in, which is uh, I would put a moratorium on any heir's household being susceptible to tax auction sale. Mm -hmm. I'd do that immediately. I'd also encourage the city to think about adopting the FEMA criteria for eligibility for housing assistance so that airship air, airship households are eligible for all and any and all housing programs available to any other owner-occupied household today. I love that. I love that. Thank you all. Um, we have a few minutes and we have some really great questions um, in the chat. I'm going to try to get to all of them. Um, one is, I'm not sure if anyone can answer this or not, but has the property appraiser's office taken steps to more easily identify Detroit air properties in the property record database and notify notify residents about unclear ownership status? Is anyone able to speak to that? I, I can slightly. Um, so it is somewhat counterintuitive, but it is not your city assessor's office that manages the actual ownership of the land. You would have to work more through the Wayne County Register of Deeds um, because that is where the proper, property ownership records are maintained. Um, there is That's going to be your primary point. Um, to my knowledge, I don't think there's been any forward movement at the city level, uh, mm -hmm. but I would imagine that Actually, this, the Detroit Future City staff has some insight because you guys were the ones who were coordinating with the county. Ashley or Benita, anything to add? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I would say just from you know, there have been a number of questions about the Register of Deeds data in the um the Q and A. And one of the things to note is I think that's a huge area of opportunity to better inform what we do. Um, we went with the assessor's data because for the register of deeds data that we were um, attempting to get, we were not able to access the, kind of the current ownership of all properties. What we could get was an extract of like the transactions that took place. So I think there's a huge opportunity to be able to um, try to access more of that for research purposes and to figure out ways to continue to update this on an ongoing basis and to determine the best way to work with community partners to connect that data um, on heirs' properties to A, get the broader picture, but also to figure out how to use that for outreach efforts. Thank you, Ashley. Um, one quick, this is an easy one. Um, someone in the audience was hoping if someone could add some clarity around what a ladybird deed is. So it seems like a pretty simple. Mac, I'm, I'm kind of looking at you because I believe you were the one that Okay, lived. yes. <laughs> yes, and actually I will defer to Alyssa on this because as the estate attorney, I think she is best situated. Um, Lady Bird deed in its most basic form 
is a deed that you file with the county and it says, you know, I, Jane Doe, live in this house and I am living with a joint right of survivorship to, you know, Jane Doe Jr., my daughter. And what the mechanics is, once once Jane Doe Sr. dies, you can go down to the county and essentially file a death certificate. Um, and ownership will, would then subsequently vest in in the, the joint survivor. Um, and when you do that, you don't have to put it through probate. Um, that's, that's how it's been explained to me. And it seems like that's the cleanest, fastest way of affecting property ownership transfers between um, relatives in the context of a, of a family. Yeah, I I would ag agree with that that basic definition. And indeed, the fun fact is that it is named after Lady Bird Johnson. Um, having said this, there is a State Bar of Michigan Journal article from a few months ago about Lady Bird deeds that I can provide to Detroit Future Cities with to send in any follow up email. It should be publicly accessible, and I found it to be a pretty um, pretty easy primer to understanding the document and and whether or not it's something to contact your attorney about. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all to the audience and the team on, on the panelist side of things for all the questions. Thank you, DSC team members for jumping in and answering some of the questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, it's a great team effort here. So um, panel, I want to thank you again for your time today and for this informative and very engaging discussion. Um, Laura, I want to provide another thank you to you for your time today and welcoming our audience and for being here. Um, and I want to, um, we have just a few minutes here to turn things over to the audience really, really quickly. Um, you know, we started off with a poll and um, I would like to, um, I would like to ask a question of you all I'm trying to launch the poll right now, but what solutions are you able to work on to address air properties in Detroit? Um, trying to get that poll who are you right now? Um, and I am having some trouble. Okay. For the sake of time, I am going to forego right. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. And if you can just um, take a moment, uh, maybe. 60 seconds, I'll probably pull it down in, in 60 seconds or less, um, but just take a moment to share with us um, what you can do or your organization um, to address air property challenges that we're seeing in Detroit. I see lots of answers coming through. We have almost 60 people in the room, so I'm hoping we could get a few more answers in. I, I see about 15, 16 responses so far. Thank you. I'm seeing a lot of increased outreach and education on the importance of wheels and estate planning. That's a critical component to this for sure. Supporting and empowering homeowners to ensure that they have clear titles. It's great. Okay, because of time, I'm going to end the poll. I'll share the results with you all right now as I uh, work to close us out. Um, thank you all once again for your time today um, and for being here and, and sharing your time with us. Um, as we continue to work in advancing economic equity and creating thriving and resilient neighborhoods, um, we want to really lead forward with this topic as a, as a way where we collectively begin to work to um, addressing the issues around air properties. Um, I'm excited to learn how you all use this information in your work. Um, and just remember that if you would like a hard copy that you are able to uh, request one from Detroit Future City. Um, when this I'm gonna also plop a link in the chat right now. Vanita will do that um, for you all to complete our survey. Um, as always, it's incredibly important to us that we get survey feedback on our events so that we can continuously improve our events. Um, it shouldn't take too much more of your time. And lastly, I just wanna extend a big thank you to our DFC team, the incredible leadership of this team 
has really, um, really been informed the way this uh, webinar was able to come together. But also a special shout out, shout out to Aaron and Vanita who've been behind the scenes making sure that everything around this event went off without a hitch. So thank you everyone. I wish everyone here um, a wonderful rest of your day. Enjoy the sunshine and we'll see you next time.